Krishna Productions presents a dramatic narration of the book, The Life of Tulsi Devi. It was written by and is narrated by Amala Bhaktadas. Both the book and the narration were copyrighted in 1991 and all rights are reserved. The book is based primarily on an English translation of the Sanskrit text of the Brahma Vaivarta Purana by Rajendranath Sen, which was published in India in 1920. The text was occasionally supplemented with clarifications and elaborations from the Shiva Purana, which was translated by a board of scholars and published in India by Motilal Banarsidas and by the Srimad Devi Bhagavatam, which was translated by Swami Vigyananda and published in India by Munshi Ram Manoharlal. <laughs> However, this entire project was inspired by and is dedicated to His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Prabhupada, founder Acharya of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness. For it was Srila Prabhupada who brought to the Western world an understanding of the importance and value of the glorious Tulsi plant. And it was under his guidance and direction that countless devotees of God learned to honor and worship Tulsi Devi daily, and thereby make wonderful spiritual advancement. These practices are still going on in all temples of the International Society for Krishna Consciousness and shall continue to go on, for the benefits of such practices are incalculable. But who is Tulsi Devi? A great devotee of Lord Krishna? Yes, but what makes her so great? Why is she worshipped in all Iskon temples, in all Vaishnav temples? What did she accomplish to deserve such worship? What is her special distinction? These important questions will be answered shortly in this brief description of her blessed life. Let us begin with the introduction. In his summary study of Srila Rupa Goswami's book, The Nectar of Devotion, Srila Prabhupada, in chapter 11, quotes the Skanda Purana as follows, quote, Let me offer my respectful obeisances unto the Tulsi tree, which can immediately vanquish volumes of sinful activities. Simply by seeing or touching this tree, one can become relieved from all distresses and diseases simply by offering obeisances to and pouring water on the Tulsi tree, one can become freed from the fear of being sent to the court of Yamaraj, the king of death who punishes the sinful. If someone sows a Tulsi tree somewhere, certainly he becomes devoted to Lord Krishna. And when the Tulsi leaves are offered in devotion at the lotus feet of Krishna, there is the full development of love of Godhead. Unquote. In Kushakrata Das's translation of the book, Sri Garga Samhita, Canto 2, Chapter 15, verses 37 through 39, and Chapter 16, verses 1 through 39, it is mentioned that Chandranana, Sri Mati Radharani's friend, had heard the scriptures directly from the lips of Gargamuni. Thus Radharani asked her what kind of worship she should perform to please Sri Krishna and to bring herself good fortune, virtue, and the fulfillment of her wish. After reflecting on this question for a moment, Chandranana told her that service to Tulsi Devi bestows the greatest virtue, good fortune, and blessing, and offers one Lord Krishna's company. She advised Radharani to gaze on Tulsi, touch her, remember her, glorify her, bow down before her, offer prayers to her, plant her, and worship her. By doing this, Chandranana assured, Tulsi would grant Radharani's desire. And also that anyone who serves Tulsi in these nine ways 
attains the result one would attain if he performed pious acts in many thousands of millions of yugas or ages. Chandranana further said that one who plants Tulsi liberates his family from the cycle of birth and death. However many branches, sub-branches, seeds, flowers and leaves there are on the Tulsi plant that one sows, that many ancestors and descendants in his family for thousands of Kalpa Yugas go to Lord Krishna's transcendental abode. When one offers Lord Krishna just one Tulsi leaf, he attains the same result as offering him every leaf and flower that exists. One who worships Lord Krishna with Tulsi leaves is not touched by sin, just as a lotus leaf is not touched by water. Yamaraj's servants will never enter a home that is in the midst of a Tulsi forest. If one plants, protects, waters, sees or touches the Tulsi plant, Tulsi burns away the reactions to sins committed with one's body, mind and words. Such holy lakes as the Pushkar, such holy rivers as the Ganges, and such deities as Lord Vasudeva reside on a single Tulsi leaf. If one serves the Tulsi plant daily, Sri Krishna will become his submissive servant. Thereafter, to please Lord Krishna, Srimati Radharani vowed to serve Tulsi Devi by following Gargamuni's instructions daily for about six months. When her vow was completed, she feasted numerous Brahmins and donated to them an enormous amount of wealth. Then in the sky, the demigods sounded their drums and the Apsaras began to dance. The demigods showered blossoms on the temple of Tulsi. Next, the beautiful four-armed Tulsi, who is very dear to Lord Krishna, appeared. She had lotus-like eyes, a golden crown, and glittering earrings, and she was seated on a glorious throne on a golden pedestal. When it descended to earth, Tulsi embraced and kissed Radharani, who was wearing a new Vijayanti garland and whose serpentine braids were covered with a yellow cloth. Tulsi said to Radharani, I am pleased with you and eternally conquered by your loving devotion. O lovely one, you very faithfully followed your vow as if you are an ordinary human being. You will attain the desire that fills your heart, mind, intelligence and senses. Lord Krishna will be kind to you. How fortunate you are! Radharani then bowed down and prayed. May I have pure devotion to Lord Krishna's lotus feet. Tulsi replied, Yes, you shall, and then disappeared. Radha, King Vrishabhanu's daughter, went home feeling happy at heart. Anyone who hears this amazing story about Srimati Radharani attains wealth, pleasure, virtue, and the supreme spiritual goal of life, love for Lord Krishna. We now conclude the introduction with the following prayers. I offer my repeated obeisances unto Vrinda, Srimati Tulsi Devi, who is very dear to Lord Keshava. O Goddess, you bestow devotional service to Lord Krishna and possess the highest truth. O Tulsi, beloved of Krishna, I bow before you again and again. My desire is to obtain the service of Sri Sri Radha and Krishna. Whoever takes shelter of you has his wishes fulfilled. Bestowing your mercy on him, you make him a resident of Vrindavan. My desire is that you will also grant me a residence in the pleasure groves of Sri Vrindavan Dham. Thus, within my vision, I will always behold the beautiful pastimes of Radha and Krishna. I beg you to make me a follower of the cowherd damsels of Raja. 
Please give me the privilege of devotional service and make me your own maidservant. This very fallen and lowly servant of Krishna prays, may I always swim in the love of Sri Sri Radha and Govinda. And now, the life of Tulsi Devi. Narad Muni asked Lord Narayan, O Bhagavan, how did the pure, chaste Tulsi Devi become your wife? Where was she born? Who was she in her previous birth? What family did she come from? And what austerities did she perform to get you as her husband? You, who are above the material energy, not subject to change, the cosmic self, the supreme God, the Lord of all, omniscient, the cause of all, omnipresent, container and preserver of all. And how did Tulsi Devi, your chief goddess, become a tree? O you who resolve all doubts, my mind is curious to know all about these points. Therefore it compels me to ask you these questions. Kindly remove these doubts from my mind. Lord Narayan then related the following account. Manu Daksha Sarvani was a partial expansion of Lord Vishnu. He was extremely virtuous, devoted to the Lord, and very famous for his good deeds. Daksha Sarvani's son, Dharma Sarvani, was also extremely virtuous. Dharma Sarvani's pious son was called Vishnu Sarvani, and his son, who was a great Vaishnav, was known as Raja Sarvani. However, Raja Sarvani's son, Vrishadvaj, was fanatically devoted to Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva lived in Vrishadvaj's house for three celestial yugas or ages and loved him more than his own sons. Vrishadvaj did not revere Lord Narayan, Goddess Lakshmi, or any of the demigods. He abolished the worship of Lakshmi in the month of Bhadra, or August and September, and the worship of Sarasvati in the month of Magha, or January and February. He did not participate in the sacrifice and worship performed out of respect for Lord Vishnu, and criticized them rather severely. The demigods did not curse him because they feared Lord Shiva. However, Surya, the sun god, no longer able to restrain his wrath, cursed him. O king, just as you are completely devoted to Lord Shiva and only to Lord Shiva, and just as you do not recognize any of the other demigods, I declare that you will now lose your wealth and prosperity. When Lord Shiva heard this curse, he became angry. Seizing his trident, he ran after Lord Surya. Afraid, the sun god went with his father, Kashyapamuni, to Brahmaloka, the highest material planet, to take shelter of Lord Brahma. But Lord Shiva pursued him there. Lord Brahma, also afraid of Lord Shiva, took Lord Surya and Kashyapamuni to the region of Vaikuntha, the spiritual or eternal world. There, with throats parched due to anxiety, they took refuge of Lord Narayan, the Lord of all. They offered obeisances to him and praised him repeatedly and finally explained why they were so apprehensive. Lord Narayan bestowed his mercy on them and granted them the power to be fearless. He said, O fearful ones, be consoled. How can you be afraid of anyone while I am here? If anyone remembers me when he is in danger, wherever he may be, I hurry to him with my Sudarshan disk in my hand and save him. 
O demigods, I am always the creator, preserver, and destroyer of this universe. In the form of Vishnu, I am the preserver. In the form of Brahma, the creator. And in the form of Shiva, the destroyer. I am Shiva, I am you, and I am Surya. I assume numerous forms and preserve the universe. So go back to your respective places. You have nothing to be afraid of. All will be well. From this day on, you have nothing to fear from Lord Shiva. He is the shelter of the pious, is easily pleased, is the servant and lord of his devotees, and is great-minded. Lord Shiva and the Sudarshan Chakra are dearer to me than my life. In the world of valor, they excel all. Lord Shiva can easily create 10 million suns and 10 million Brahmas. For him, nothing is impossible. He is not conscious of the external world. Meditating on me, his heart centered, he is absorbed day and night. From his five faces, he repeats my mantra with devotion, and he always sings my glories. Day and night, I also always think of his welfare. To whatever degree one worships me, to that degree I favor one. The nature of Shiva is all auspiciousness. While Lord Narayan was speaking, Lord Shiva arrived. His eyes were red and he was sitting on his bull carrier, holding his trident. He dismounted quickly and humbly offered obeisances with devotion to the Lord of Lakshmi, the tranquil Supreme Being. Lord Narayan, Vishnu, was sitting on his jeweled studded throne. He was decorated with a crown, earrings, and a garland, and was holding his disc. His form was extremely beautiful, and his complexion like a fresh blue rain cloud. Each of his attendants had four arms and was fanning him with four hands. His body was anointed with sandal paste and he was wearing a yellow garment. Lord Vishnu, who shows kindness to his devotees, was chewing betel nut that had been offered to him by his wife Lakshmi. Smiling, he was watching and listening to the dancing and singing of the Vidyadaris. After Lord Shiva bowed down to Lord Narayan, he bowed to Lord Brahma. Lord Surya and Kashyapa Muni respectfully saluted Lord Shiva. Then Lord Shiva worshipped Lord Vishnu, the Lord of all, and seated himself on a throne. The attendants of Lord Narayan began to fan Lord Shiva with white whisks to relieve him of the fatigue of his journey. Lord Shiva, because of being in contact with Lord Vishnu's virtues, then assumed a cheerful disposition and adored the eternal being with his five mouths. Lord Narayan was highly gratified. With sweet nectarine words, he said, O Lord Shiva, you are the symbol of all good and welfare. Thus to ask about your welfare would be foolish. I would ask you only out of respect for the rules of society and the method prescribed in the Vedas. One who yields fruits of devotion and gives all prosperity should not be asked about his austerities or material prosperity. Since you preside over knowledge, it would be useless to ask if you are increasing in knowledge. It would be equally useless to ask a conqueror of death if he is free from all danger. But you have come to my residence for a reason. What is it? Have you become angry over something? O oh Lord Vishnu, King Vrishadvaj is my great devotee. Lord Surya has cursed him, and that has made me angry. Out of affection for my son, the king, I was about to kill Surya. But Surya sought shelter of Lord Brahma, and now both of them have sought your protection. Those who are distressed and take shelter of you, either by speaking about you or by remembering you, become completely safe and free from danger. They overcome death and old age. What to speak of those who come personally to you and take shelter? When one remembers you, his dangers disappear. All good comes to him. O oh Lord of the world, what will become of my foolish devotee who by the curse of Lord Surya has lost his fortune and prosperity? O oh Lord Shiva, a half hour has elapsed here in Vaikuntha. In that time, 21 celestial yugas have passed away. Therefore, King Vrishadvaj, 
through the revolution of irresistible and dreadful time, is dead. His son, Hamsadvaj, in the course of time, also died. Hamsadvaj begot two noble sons named Dharmadvaj and Kushadvaj. They are both great Vaishnavs, but because of Lord Surya's curse, they have become luckless. They lost their kingdoms, including all property and prosperity. But they are now engaged in worshipping Goddess Lakshmi, who is pleased with their efforts. Therefore, she has agreed to descend to earth and expand herself partially by taking birth from the wives of those two kings. Then, by the favor of Goddess Lakshmi, Dharmadvaj and Kushadvaj will become prosperous, mighty kings. O Lord Shiva, your devotee Vrishadvaj is dead, so return to your abode. O Lord Brahma, Lord Surya and Kashyapamuni, you also should return to your realms. Bhagavan Vishnu then went with his wife to the inner apartments. The demigods went cheerfully to their own abodes, Lord Shiva continuing his practice of austerity. Dharmadvaj and Kushadvaj performed harsh asceticism and worshipped Goddess Lakshmi. Thereafter, they separately obtained the blessings they desired. By Goddess Lakshmi's favor, they again became the rulers of the earth. They acquired great spiritual merits, were married and begot children. King Dharmadvaj was married to Madhavi. After some time, she became pregnant with a partial incarnation of Goddess Lakshmi. However, the infant remained in Madhavi's womb for 100 celestial years. Day by day, Madhavi's luster increased. Then, on an auspicious day and moment, when there was a full moon in the month of Kartik, on a Friday, she gave birth. The grace of the goddess of fortune, Lakshmi, manifested through the baby. There were marks of the lotus flower on the infant's feet. Her face looked like the autumnal moon. Her eyes resembled blooming lotuses, and her lips appeared like ripe bimba fruit. Her palms and the soles of her feet were reddish. Her navel was deep, and just above it were three folds. Her buttocks were round, and her body was delightfully warm in the winter and cool in the summer, very pleasant to touch. Her breast was firm and her waist thin, and the light shining from her body surrounded her like a halo. Her complexion was white, like a champaka flower, and her hair looked beautiful. Because her beauty was incomparable, the sages called her Tulsi. <laughs> 